So our first speaker for the session is Dr. David Coghill. Now his true passion is, was learning about funk and soul in 1960s London. But today he's here to tell us about ADHD in a talk titled, Let the Wild Rumpus Start. Dr. Coggle, thank you. I'm getting old, but not quite, uh, not quite that old. So listen, up on the screen, some typical press coverage and jokes about ADHD. Anyone in the room willing to admit that's kind of on their side of thinking about ADHD? Because actually there's still an awful lot of it around. There's an awful lot of politics in ADHD and the politics gets in way of the science of, of ADHD. So let's think about that as we go through a story. Uh, and, and I think the story is really important to ADHD. A lot of people think of it as a new disorder. Anyone know who this guy is? You know his name? Fidgety Phil. Fidgety Philip, yeah. Uh, Fidgety Phil came about the construction of a paediatrician in the mid-1800s. And a lot of people now use Fidgety Phil as the paradigm for ADHD, or at least as something to tell us that ADHD has been around for a long time. People don't know often his brother. I call him Johnny Airhead, but Johnny... <laughs> Johnny head in the air. And so whilst Fidgety Phil tells us a lot about the hyperactive, impulsive parts of ADHD, Johnny head in the air also typifies that inattentive bit of ADHD. And if anyone hasn't seen this book, Strumpfelpeter, Shock-Haired Johnny by Henrik Hoffmann, German pediatrician in the mid um, mid-1800s. It's the quintessential pe behavioural paediatrician's or child psychiatrist bedtime storybook. It includes a whole range of other psychopathologies in there that are really both remarkable to tell us how long these things have been around, but also how accurate people's observations were. So the first thing I want to tell you is ADHD is common. How common? Well, an analysis of all of the, the epidemiological literature from around the world, from a colleague of mine, Guilherme Palanchik from Brazil, says around 5.2, 5.4% of school-age children meet the criteria for ADHD. Now, that seems a lot, but what proportion of children do you think meet the symptom criteria for ADHD. Anyone want to hazard a guess? I'm, I'm a bit deaf, so you have to... 18%. Any increase on 18%? Around a quarter. If you just went on symptom criteria, then around a quarter of children would meet criteria for ADHD. How do we get it from 25% down to 5%? Well, it starts early. It's continuous, it's pervasive across settings, and most importantly, it's impairing. Now, that has a huge message for us as clinicians, because if you just do a symptom checklist, if you send out a questionnaire to diagnose ADHD, then you're going to hugely overdiagnose ADHD. The other thing we've heard about ADHD is there's an explosion of it. And actually, Guilherme tracked all of the epidemiological studies across the last 30 years and found that not only is ADHD common, but it's also not increasing. It's only as common now as it was 30-plus years ago. So why is it increasing in what we call administrative prevalence? Well, that depends where you live. If you live in the States, then the prevalence of ADHD administratively is only 5% in one state, the lightest colored one. Can you see which one that is? I'll tell you, Nevada. 
What else is in Nevada, apart from ADHD at root prevalence? Las Vegas. Isn't it a bit ironic that the only state in the whole of the US to have an administrative prevalence equal to the actual epidemiological prevalence is the one where all the gambling comes? Of course, people who live in Nevada don't gamble. They're not stupid. That's all the incomers that do that. We did another interesting analysis of diagnostic rates of ADHD by political persuasion within a state. Which states, Democrats or Republicans, have the highest levels of ADHD? It's Republicans. We did that before the last election, <laughs> and we repeated it after the last election, and it got stronger. Now, it's not that Republicans vote for ADHD or because they've got ADHD. It's to do with a whole range of other demographic, de demographic details. But the real shocking thing of this picture that's up here, this graph that's up here, of course, is that many of the states have prevalences up around 11%. So twice that for the actual epidemiological prevalence. And that's something that's really difficult for the rest of us in ADHD because we all get tarred with that same brush. Actually, what Guilherme found when he looked across countries is if you use the same instruments and the same rules, the same methods, then ADHD is equally common in all the countries across the world. But it's clear that the diagnosis and the treatment isn't. This is the rates of stimulant prescribing, or in fact, no, the rates of ADHD medication prescribing just across three regions, three regions I know reasonably well. I can knock America because I've got an American passport. I can knock the UK because I've got one, and I don't quite yet feel confident about knocking Australia, but <laughs> you lot can think about that. In Australia, 6.7 over... Over the 5% are receiving stimulant medication. In Australia, it's around 1.4%. It's been increasing, but the epidemic that we hear of in the prescribing is from none at all to some. In the UK, it's still around 0 0.6. So only 1 in 10 children with ADHD in the UK are actually being treated. And we recently talked about that in a press conference, and suddenly, suddenly, some of that press changed. From ADHD is overdiagnosed to why aren't we recognising the problems in these children? And I don't know enough about Australia yet, but what I do know is that there's a huge variation in prescribing for ADHD in Australia. These are figures per 100,000 children. Not 100,000 population, but 100,000 children. And you'll see that they range from 300, 400, let's call it, to 28,000. Now, that is at least a hundredfold difference in rates of prescribing in different parts of Australia. I'm going to be a bit cruel here. Anyone here from South Australia? Cool. <laughs> That is really cool, because ADHD doesn't exist in South Australia. <laughs> At least not for child psychiatrists, it doesn't. They deny its existence. Now, you must all be paediatricians, yeah? Yeah, good. Keeping the flag, flag up. Actually, South Australia isn't the, lo the lowest of prescribing. Now, does that look high? 28,642 per 100,000? Looks like a quarter of kids in that place are getting medication. But remember, this is prescriptions per year. And you can only have one prescription for one month. So if you're on full-time medication, you've got to divide that by 12. So it's around, again, between 1.6 and 2% of children in Australia. Well, maybe that's about right, but probably we're still under-recognizing ADHD. Now, is ADHD important? Is it impairing? Who recognises top left? Yeah, Michael Phelps. Top right. Someone no one gets. 
Solange Knowles, Beyonce's sister. Bottom left, Will Smith, middle. And bottom right, Richard Branson. All of them hugely successful, yeah? Solange Knowles not quite as successful as her sister. <laughs> but all of them pretty successful. All of them have ADHD. So ADHD doesn't need to be a problem. But actually, Michael Phelps, drunk, driving under the influence and, and drug addiction. Will Smith. The only reason Will Smith is an actor is because when he was a rapper, he didn't pay his taxes. He didn't pay his taxes because he was trying to avoid them. He just didn't get around to it. He was too disorganized. He had to take his job in the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air in order to pay off his taxes. Richard Branson, highly successful, but he's had huge failures in his, um, in his businesses. And Paris Hill, well, Solange Knowles, do you know why she's, what her problems were? It was her who beat up Jay-Z in the hotel foyer when he got out of a lift. So again, aggression control problems. And these are all very common with people with ADHD. And Paris Hilton, well, she's had a few problems, hasn't she? <laughs> But we also see a whole range. I, I like these slides that they've got us doing in, in, in Do Not Forget the Bubbles, but they took out my real prize slide. And that slide's really densely packed, which way they wouldn't, wouldn't allow it. And it pretty much says people with ADHD have no education because they drop out from school early and they don't succeed. They can't get a job. They don't have any money. They have heaps of traffic violations and don't have a driving license. They have multiple partners and early teenage pregnancies, but no stability in relationships, either loving relationships or family relationships. And then down the bottom, it says they watch a lot of television. What else are you going to do other than watch television? If you've got no education, no job, you have accidents all the time, you've no driving license, and you've no friends and no partner. It's really quite sad. And also, high rates of crime. A third of the inmates in youth detention centers have ADHD, almost all of them undiagnosed. High rates of substance misuse, high rates of psychiatric disorders. And for a mainly pediatric audience, the one thing I will say to you is if you're going to treat ADHD, then learn and make sure that you're diagnosing the psychiatric comorbidities. I know you're very good at the physical things, but make sure you're up to speed with all the other comorbidities because they're hugely important. Increased mortality <coughs> rates. People with ADHD die earlier. Those who are diagnosed as adults and have their diagnosis missed during childhood have mortality rates of four times that of the general population. So ADHD is very serious as well. ADHD is just poor parenting, isn't it? That's why these kids are, are misbehaved. And of course it's not. You know it's not. But why is parenting such an issue in ADHD? Well, it's highly heritable. We know that ADHD has a heritability of 74%. Many of the mothers of kids with ADHD have undiagnosed, untreated ADHD themselves. And that's another favor that you can do people is by helping them realize that. If you had ADHD as a child and it wasn't diagnosed and it wasn't treated, what's the likelihood of your experience of being parented? Optimal or suboptimal? Suboptimal. If you have a suboptimal experience of being parented and you become a parent, then that is an intergenerational problem that you also have to master. You don't have that picture of good parenting or optimal parenting inside. Then I give you a difficult child who's got ADHD, who's hyperactive, who's inattentive, who's impulsive, and I stretch your already stretched limits further, of course there are going to be um, interactions. Of course there are going to be attachment issues. One of the things that makes me shiver and makes my hair stand on end and makes me wish I'd taken my medication in the morning is when people talk about um, is it attachment or is it ADHD? Because, of course, the two very, very much come together. The other thing about heritability that's very important that we're understanding now is the gene-environment interactions. 
And so a lot of what we call genetic may actually be an interaction between the genes and the environment. But we've got to be a bit careful when we talk about environmental factors and ADHD because many of those factors actually can be influenced by genes themselves. So smoking during pregnancy, drinking alcohol during pregnancy, now when we do genetically sensitive designs, it actually looks like it's often mum's ADHD that puts her more at risk of drinking and smoking during pregnancy that increases the rates of ADHD. I'm not saying it's fine to smoke, it's fine to drink during pregnancy, but it's less likely to cause ADHD than we thought. Finally, which treatments work and which don't? Well, there are many things that do work. Unfortunately, all the evidence that we have at the moment suggests that parent training does not work at reduce ADHD symptoms. Now, that's a bit of a bummer for most of us because that's something that we really want to be able to say, that these parents are having problems. If we help them to manage their child's behaviour, it will reduce their ADHD. Well, it doesn't. The good news is that it actually does help reduce negative parenting, improve positive parenting, and improve behaviour. So it improves the child, but not their ADHD. The real treatments that we have that do improve ADHD, as you're all aware of, are medication treatments. And we published two weeks ago a network meta-analysis of medication treatments for ADHD in children, adolescents, and adults. And the good news is that all the licensed medications work. Bad news is they don't all work the same as each other. Actually, we came out in favour of methylphenidate as the first medication for ADHD, which won't surprise you. But above the amphetamines, not because it worked better, because it didn't. The amphetamines actually worked better, but there were less adverse effects, better tolerability and better acceptability with methylphenidate. So... I used to say toss a coin because the evidence was pretty much that they were equal to each other. Now I think we have to say that um, probably methylphenidate should be your first choice. The real problem we've got with treating ADHD with medications is the outcomes. When I, I thought I was pretty good, I was an international world expert on ADHD. And when we looked at how many of our kids with standard treatment here, take this. Is it helping? Yeah? OK, go away, keep taking it. Only 44% of our kids were actually in remission. Most of them had really significant symptoms. So we looked at a range of things you can do. Standardised titration protocols, looking for maximum response at minimum dose. And probably most importantly, so as I finish, the one thing I want to leave you with is routine use of standardised measures. Not questionnaires. Take the time to ask questions using that questionnaire as a prompt. Measure the response and titrate the treatment <coughs> compared to that response. And when you do that, we found that we went from 44% of our patients in remission to over two-thirds of our patients. Our outcomes in a real-world clinic with 900 patients were as good as the randomised controlled trials. So if you take away one thing from this, it would be, for me, routine use of standard measures. If you went to see the doctor about your hypertension and they didn't measure your blood pressure, would you be happy? If you were treating diabetes and you didn't measure the HbA1c, would you be happy? If you were measuring obesity and they didn't weigh you, would you be unhappy? Why is it acceptable for us just to say, is the medicine <laughs> helping? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cockle. That was very informative. Yes. Uh, we might have some questions now, if that's okay with you. Um, Claire, what's happening on the Twitter? Um, so on Twitter, everyone's loving the story of ADHD and Fidgety Phil and Johnny Head in the Air. Um, 
questions are a lot about why we're not recognising ADHD in Australia um, and what we can do to increase recognition. Um, and then one interesting one from Liz Crow, but I'll get you to answer the first question. Okay, first. so why aren't we recognising? Well, it's not just Australia that's not recognising. Let's put that into context. That everywhere outside of the United States, even Canada just across the border, probably under-recognises. Um, I think partly we under-recognise because we set our bar too high. And there's a good reason for doing that, because we don't want to give stimulant medications, for example, to everyone, but also because we're misrecognizing the ADHD symptoms often as misbehaving in boys, and we're missing the girls because they don't have the misbehavior. They sit to the back of the class, and they're just not there. They're just not seen as a problem. Um, so what we're doing about that is the problem is screening is quite difficult because screening ends up with a lot of false positives and we don't want that either. So in China, I did a, a, an experiment to get teachers to interview teachers about children that they were worried about. And we managed to get the accuracy up and the false positives way down so that by giving a questionnaire to parents and then getting a teacher to interview the teacher, we managed to recognize four out of five kids with ADHD and only get two kids for every true positive. So we had to interview two children in order to get one right. Previously, you'd have to interview about seven children to get one right. So we're trying to get that through the NHMRC at the moment and see whether we can, can improve that. But I think it's about our antennae. I think some of it's about worrying if we get it wrong. A lot of it probably also is about um, parent education. Parents coming and telling us that their children actually have problems and recognising this is something we can do something about. Great response. Um, Liz Crow is wondering, should we be screening mothers antenatally who have ADHD to reduce the risk when an infant is born and put in supports? Well, cool. <laughs> great question. Um, I think it would be great to be screening mothers antenatally for all sorts of mental health problems, and I would include ADHD as one of those. I think it would be um, then okay for us to continue to observe, but we don't want, again, to over-recognise and over-label children. So I think one of the problems, again, we have here in Australia is about following up someone's health across different places, different people, because we don't have that kind of health record that you have in the United Kingdom that follows you from birth and actually is linked to your mother's birth. So I think linking records, understanding better, but actually, yes, making good quality notes that can be transferred from one person to the other, one place to the other, would be a step in the right direction. Thank, Thank you very you. much. We have time for just one question from the floor. Uh, thanks, um, David Meldon from Lismore. I, it's just a very practical point. Um, we're following on from your last slide. Any recommendations about the standardised measures? Yeah, I do. Oh, I've got one. Right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my mistake. I forgot. Um, yes, I do. So what we've used, and we've used it now for the last 15 years, um, and, and I try not to be prescriptive about it, but I am... Um, I, I like when someone gives me the opportunity to talk, is, is a questionnaire called the SNAP. The SNAP is freely available. All it is is the 18 items, the 18 symptoms of ADHD, and they're scored 0, 1, 2, and 3. And we don't use it as a questionnaire. We use it as a semi-structured interview. So every single time anyone comes to our clinic for anything, if they've got ADHD, not every kid without, but we will do the snap. And I will interview you. The reason for interviewing you is if you've had a terrible week, 
then you tend to go three, 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 because you want to tell me it's a terrible week. So I, I think we're better to, to talk about your week and to talk about how things are and how they've changed. And what we do then is we simply add up all the scores and we divide by 18. And so you get a score somewhere between zero and three. And I know because we've done this both in research and in our clinic, if your score is over two, that's not acceptable. If your score is under one, that's probably pretty good. And if your score is between one and two, then we probably have some work to do, but let's discuss how we do it. So that's where the, the thinking comes in. So it becomes a very simple way to be able to understand the symptoms. Of course, symptoms aren't everything. My view is, however, if you don't get the symptoms right, optimised down as far as you can, then you're unlikely to be able to do a lot of the other things. Once the symptoms are down, people can engage in a lot of other work with you. So I would use the SNAP. The ADHD rating scale is the same, but you have to pay for it. The SNAP's freely available. Um, and and if, if you want any help on it, then email me, because we've got a paper telling you how to use it. David, thank you so much for your thank time you. and your experience.